Welcome to Sartor TV. I'm Vanessa Tyler. Today, author Kelly Palmer is on a mission to change the world, to make us all a little bit smarter no matter where we work, as we join the expertise economy. Kelly, thank you so much for joining us. I'm so happy to be here today. Thank you for having me. Your resume is quite impressive. You worked for companies of our generation, LinkedIn, Yahoo, Sun Microsystems. Please tell us your roles at those businesses and what changed while you were there. I've been fortunate enough to spend uh, my entire career in Silicon Valley at some of these big tech companies. And I think what was interesting is seeing how uh, when I actually changed careers and I started out in product development, went into corporate strategy, and then mid-career actually got into corporate learning. And so started that phase of my career while I was at Sun Microsystems. And I was a little surprised at how antiquated some of the models of corporate learning were. Taking the model from the university system of classroom training, lectures, and really imparting information on employees and hoping that um, people would learn and transfer that knowledge back to learn, you know, on learning on the job. And what we found over time is that, that study after study is showing that we're spending billions of dollars doing this and it's incredibly ineffective. And so you have to wonder, you know, why do we keep doing that if we know that that's not effective? And it's one of the reasons that we, you know, write the book is to talk about that, you know, what you, what people thought would work before, which really wasn't working, isn't going to suffice for the future at all. How tough was that to change that model of learning, especially at these established companies? It's an evolution, it's a process, and I still don't think that a lot of companies have changed. What we're, um, what we're finding in the book, one of the things that we did was we interviewed some of the most forward-thinking companies and their CEOs, business leaders, and chief learning officers to say, you guys seem to be doing things in new and different ways. We'd love to hear about that, write about that, and tell the world about it. And fortunately, you know, we were part of uh, my co-author, David Blake, who's the co-founder of Degreed, an educational technology company. He and I came together to write this book because one of the things that I did, you know, as I was chief learning officer at some of these tech companies is actually implement some of these changes at the companies that I was at, specifically at LinkedIn, uh, started a learning organization from the ground up and started implementing some of these new ways of thinking about learning. And so I would say that the movement if you can call it that is kind of just beginning that you know there are a small subset of companies who are saying look we've got to do this differently and let's uh, let's figure out how to do that so I think it's still a process and it's evolving why did you write the expertise economy how the smartest companies use learning to engage compete and succeed Great question. So I think, you know, with David uh, coming at it from an education technology entrepreneur perspective, really um, with a mission to help people get credit for all the learning that they do and build skills for the future, that was the angle that he was coming at it from. But he had never been a, a learning practitioner, run learning organizations at companies, and that's where my expertise there, combined with the angle that David was coming at, we thought, wow, this is a really a great uh, way to look at this problem of upskilling and reskilling the workforce of the future because that's really the key. It's not just about how do you change uh, the models of corporate learning. It's like how do you change the mindset of business leaders and CEOs who, who need to think about whether they have the skills that they need to succeed in the future. And if you ask most CEOs, do you know what skills your company has or the employees at your company have to succeed for the future? It's a hard question to answer and most of them probably couldn't. And so we thought in writing the book, you know, this is where the rubber really meets the road with the business leaders and the CEOs. And if, and if we know they can start thinking about this in a really strategic way, we can see some real change. And you can see some uh, examples of, of CEOs who are really taking this seriously. Um, for example, Randall Stevenson at AT&T is telling his employees now, um, in the New York Times there was an article written that he's told his employees that if they're not learning at least five to ten hours a week on their own that, uh, that their skills will be obsolete and that they won't be able to be competitive in the workforce moving forward. Basically, 
will they have a job moving forward if they're not learning on their own? That's one approach to learning, kind of, uh, kind of, uh, a, a, I guess, a little um, uh, progressive or or alarming to some people saying, oh my God, I need new skills. I better start learning all the time. There's other companies like Unilever, who's uh, Tim Munden, their CLO, has actually been working with their CEO and business leaders to say, look, we have 161,000 employees across the globe. We know that we're gonna have to upskill and reskill a huge portion of those employees. And how, how do we start thinking about that now so that we don't have to have the scenario where you're laying off people because they don't have the right skills to move forward and then you're hiring back people or hopefully hiring back people with those skills. Can you instead have a strategy where you're actually saying, we've got great employees at our company. Some of those skills that they have are going to become obsolete. There's new skills they're going to need. How can we help people get the skills that we need for our company to, to move forward and be successful? When you mean learn on your own, what does that exactly mean? Does that mean reading an article once a week? Or does that mean actually taking some kind of a class? That's a great question too, because one of the things that I think has to really change is our definition of what learning is. I think we have a very uh, myopic view of that where we most people think, oh, you have to go to, to a class. Do you have to go to a class to learn? Or there's really formal ways that you learn. But if you broaden the definition of what learning actually is, you may find that you're actually learning all the time every day. It's one of the things that we, um, that we talk about at Degreed, our company all the time, that people are learning all the time through reading uh, books, through reading articles, listening to podcasts, um, going to events, Listen, watching Sartre TV, for example, all of those are great ways to actually learn and build your skills, yet where do you ever get credit for that? Or it might happen uh, organically, but you're not actually tracking what you're, what you're learning. And if you did, you might find that you're building and learning new skills that you weren't even aware. So that's one of the things that we're trying to do is actually broaden the definition of what learning is so that people realize that there's lots of different ways to learn. Is there a, a culture in business today to encourage expertise? I think so. I think the culture, um, and, we, and we write about this in the book, at learning as a competitive advantage has so much to do with building the right kind of culture in your company that encourages learning. A lot of employees will complain that I just am so busy at my job, I don't have time to learn. And I, I think it's companies who are building a culture of learning actually say, look, this is so incredibly important to the, the success of our company. We want employees to take a certain amount of time as part of their job to be learning all the time and every day. And those are the kinds of companies that we write about in the book that are you know, think, being very thoughtful around how they create a culture of learning because it's not enough just to provide learning to everyone if you're not gonna give them time to actually consume learning and not only consume it, but we talk about a simple learning loop in the book where you need to learn something, but then you need to go and practice it on the job. You need to get some feedback about how you did in practicing those skills. And then finally, you need some time for reflection on Wow, what skill? What did I learn there, and how can I, uh, you know, how can I apply that to my to my job? And so that simple learning loop and the and the fact that you, that's how learning really happens. If you can allow that as part of people's job, um, it, it it can have tremendous benefits to companies, and then they'll realize that their employees are keeping up with what they need to know to be successful at the job that they have or getting ready for a, a future career. You mentioned Degreed a little bit, and uh, I wanted you to talk a little bit about your role at Degreed and how it is your mission to change the world. Degreed is, you know, an amazing company. I was very drawn to it by the vision and mission of the company, and uh, really, we're we're out to change the way the world learns. And I say that because, again, if we go back to this notion of 
uh, corporate learning being very antiquated and be, it being based on classroom learning and a learning management system that attracts compliance training. And it's a little disheartening because the fact is, is that you know people really do love to learn, uh, especially when they care about something. Yet in, cor in corporate environments, what we've done is actually make people hate learning a little bit. You know, I mean, how many people like to take compliance courses, and how many people are really um, engaged when people tell them they have to go, uh, have to go to a certain class that they don't think feel is relevant to them, or they're not motivated about. So, degreed is actually a way to say, look, learning should be personalized to who a person is and what they want to do, and of course. Um, it's not just about the employee. You also want to map that to what the business goals are. But I would say that when businesses can give um, guidance to employees about where they're going and what their vision and mission is and what their goals are for the future, employees can think about their own career aspirations and then map you know, what they're trying to do with what the company's trying to do. And uh, let's give our employees a little more credit and realize that they can actually, uh, they can actually combine those two. So Degreed is really a way to help people learn from a variety of sources, whether it be from you know, classes, books, podcasts, articles, get credit for all their learning so that they can actually build a personalized plan and see that they're building skills for now and for the future and then map the learning to skills to their careers. And, um, and then at, at a company level, we're allowing uh, organizations to look at you know what skills do employees have, what skills do they need, and where do we know to, where do we need to go for the future? So answering that tough question, that business leaders and CEOs should be asking themselves, do we have the skills that we need to win in the marketplace? And Degreed allows you the analytics to actually take a look at that and be able to answer that question, which I think is so critically important. You start the book talking about Sun Microsystems. What happened and, and what lesson did the company fail to learn? We open the book with uh, with the story of Sun Microsystems, where I spent you know a huge part of my career. And Sun was an amazing company, an amazing place to to work. Um, in its time, at the top of its you know industry, competing with giants like uh, Microsoft, IBM, HP. Um, if people don't know, um, Sun actually created the Java programming language, uh, which most developers still use to this day. And we created uh, computers that actually ran uh, companies, financial institutions, airlines, Wall Street. So we were the backbone of that infrastructure. So very successful company for, for a lot of years. And when uh, the dot-com bust happened, um, it, there was a, a, an opportunity, you know, the, the industry changed quite a bit and certain companies needed to reinvent themselves and to say, look, the industry is changing, we need to think about how we need to do things differently. And I think that, um, you know, in the case of Sun, um, it, it didn't reinvent itself. It um, actually came to a point where um, where we were valued, I think, at $65 billion. And in one year, we lost uh, um, almost um, half of that value and then ended up being acquired by Oracle for $7.6 $7 billion in 2010. And it was sad because people loved Sun Microsystems. It, it was a very successful company. But if you look at a company like Microsoft, who it was in a similar situation, if we think back at what Microsoft, what was happening with Microsoft, if they hadn't reinvented themselves over the last eight years, they would not be around, but they did. They actually were very proactive in terms of reinventing who they were, what products they produced, and in addition, reskilling and upskilling their workforce, which they're um, actively doing today. Reinvention. You said it several times. It's a word thrown around a lot. We hear it all the time. Um, what exactly is reinvention that makes a difference? I'll give an example. You know, when I was at um, Yahoo running uh, the learning organization there, the the reinvention for them was realizing. You know, Yahoo had been a uh, a desktop um, application, and it seems funny now because we're all on our mobile phones all the time, you know, dealing with apps. And if you don't have a mobile app, 
you're really not in business. But back then when I was at Yahoo, um, that was still emerging, right? So what they saw was an industry trend that said, we better get on mobile right now because that's where people want to be. So that's part of the reinvention of what, you know, Microsoft, or, uh, what Yahoo did was to say, we really need to make sure that we're not just staying on desktop, that we need to move to mobile. So their strategy was then to hire or hope to hire many more mobile developers who could help them with their strategy. The problem was is that Yahoo being in the middle of uh, the tech industry was competing with all the other companies who also wanted mobile developers. And it's tough. You're in a you know, you're in a, a war for talent in the Silicon Valley for certain jobs. And what we ended up doing was actually creating a program where we could actually develop some of the people within Yahoo to become mobile developers and, you know, took a nine month uh, um, program to actually do that. And I'd say that that's a, that was an actually pretty forward thinking strategy. You see a lot of companies today that are doing that now, realizing that data science is a really um, hot skill that a lot of companies I don't care what field you're in, whether you're in learning or marketing or finance or engineering, everybody needs to see all this data that we're getting and try to analyze it, get insights out of that and tell a story. And so the most proactive companies now are saying, hey, there's not gonna be enough data scientists to hire out there. We better start helping our employees build those skills internally. So you'll see quite a few companies using that upskilling strategy within their company and doing it proactively so that they don't get into a space where it, it's a huge problem. Half the battle may be getting CEOs to stop looking at learning as getting a new skill, but looking at learning as a business strategy. You said it before several times, what's the difference between upskilling versus reskilling? If you think about, um, for example, let's take d data science as a, as a great example. There may be, Booz Allen Hamilton is a company that, for example, is running a, a program that they publicly talk about a lot. I think it's an amazing program called Data Science 5K, where they're actually uh, upskilling and reskilling 25% of their workforce in data science skills. Now there's, if you're going to, if you, they already have a lot of data analysts in their company and they're saying things are moving so fast these days, the acceleration has never been faster. So the people who have data s analytics skills today are going to need to, that, that um, industry is not stopping. New components of data science are emerging every day. So that's an, uh, an upskill strategy where you're taking data analysts and saying, we're gonna teach you more about, about that field and that's upskilling, right? So um, in reskilling, they're also telling people that if you don't already have the basics of uh, data science or data analytics, we're gonna actually uh, reskill reskill you you're going from one field that you know you were expert in and now now we're actually going to reskill you into another area so giving employees the opportunity to do both of those i think is is so amazing because what they're getting are people that are raising their hands and saying look i'm doing this job now but i see the future is is in data analytics and data science and i really would love to get into that and imagine if your employee is saying great we've got a program and we're going to help you reskill in order to do that. So those are a couple a couple of examples. It's interesting a lot of I wonder if a lot of employers would see that as a risk meaning after they upskill and reskill perhaps mean retaining those employees. That that's a question that I I think I get asked every uh every time uh, that we talk about the book, it's like, okay, what if we train these people and then they and then they leave? They take their skills to another company, and uh, it's ironic though because if you think about what if you don't train them, and then you're stuck with people who don't have the right skills, and then potentially that means that you have to have a reduction in force, which is never fun. And if all companies have that attitude that. I'm only I'm not going to train people or or reskill them because they might not stay then nobody wins but imagine in, in contrast that all companies say hey companies need to step up and have a responsibility to skill their employees whether they retain them or not and then all companies kind of win because we're all in that game of upskilling and reskilling the workforce for the better of 
the industry or the country um, or the world. I mean, that's kind of a higher level um, view of it. And then I would say there's also another incentive for companies to actually take this upskilling and reskilling seriously and realize that it's their responsibility because never before has it been so clear that employees own your own your brand as a company. And when I when I say that, what I mean is is that employees are, are are making a conscious choice about where they want to go work and oftentimes they're making that choice based on whether the company is going to uh, help them get new skills whether they're going to give them new opportunities to learn and to grow in their careers and so it can be a huge competitive advantage for a company to say look we offer lots of development opportunities we want the best and the brightest to come work for us so it's a recruiting tool and it's a branding thing because i know for for example, at LinkedIn, I, I love LinkedIn. I had a great four years working there and I got to learn a lot and I got to um, build a lot of new skills. So now all of a sudden I'm a brand ambassador for LinkedIn and my experience there. Even though I didn't stay there my whole career, I still think it's a fantastic company and I'll always feel that way because of what they gave me. So employers should think about that. You know, How do their employees talk about their company whether they're there or even when they're not there? How do adults learn best with so much on everyone's mind between children and, and you know, this and everything else? It's, it's tough to really sit down. And, it's not like you're in college when the only thing you have to do is study. You have other things to do, right. including work. So one of the things that um, people can think about is, again, when we go back to this notion of broadening our our view of what learning actually is. If I ask most people, you know, how do you like to learn? When you need to learn something new, typically what do you do? And if I were to ask you that, what would you say? I would say reading. Okay, so that that's a, a big answer. A lot of people read a lot of books. And if you think of uh, um, some of our our most uh, well-respected leaders in business, whether it be Bill Gates or Mark Zuckerberg or Elon Musk, all these uh, big CEOs, what do they talk about? Crazy smart people, right? And what, what do they talk about? That Mark Zuckerberg gives a reading list of the books that he's reading and every two weeks gives a new one. So he's reading a book every two weeks and I think Elon Musk is known at one point of reading two books a day. So, you know, I mean, imagine these crazy smart people and those are some of the ways that they're learning on their own. But do we often say, oh, I'm, I'm building new skills or I'm learning because I'm reading books? I, people don't necessarily equate that. The other, other thing is, is that since um, time is, you know, crazy and there's so much content that's being thrown at people all the time, I think people learn when they have time in different ways. So for example, I love listening to HBR IdeaCast. It's one of my favorite um, podcasts and I love to learn from that. And when I'm hiking on the weekends or when I'm commuting to work, I'm putting on podcasts that I like and learning that way. And that's one, or I'm, I'm reading a lot of articles a, as well online or a lot of, um, things like that. So uh, YouTube, a lot of people say they Google or they watch YouTube videos for learning. And so now, now there's ways that you can fit chunks of learning into your life if you think about how you might be able to incorporate that. A lot of people are doing it anyway and they're not, just not realizing it. But then if you're more conscious about it, you can say, oh, I can actually put a goal in place and I want to listen to you know, a podcast a week or read a book every month or whatever your goals are and realize, hey, I I'm actually making some progress in learning. What are the um, neural myths of learning? So it's interesting, we wrote a chapter in the book called How We Really Learn, and in doing the research uh, through that part of the book, what we realized is that there are a lot of neuro myths about how we learn uh, best that we tried to debunk in the, in the book because uh, uh, I'll give you a few examples. And there's, they call them neuro myths because they're things that people just assume are true and then they say to other people and then, it, and then that idea uh, proliferates and, and everyone just thinks it's true. So let me give you a couple of examples. Um, so one neuro myth is that uh, people say there are optimal times when you can learn and then after a certain period of your life, you're no longer really learning anymore, that your brain isn't really forming those, those new uh, 
parts of knowledge. But the, the truth is, and what we learned from neuroscientists is that's absolutely false and that we can actually be learning new skills all of our lives. And so that it doesn't matter. I think they were saying, you know, there's some optimal times like when you're a child and up through the age of 17 or 25 was the, was the neuro myth. But what we know now is that you can learn as well in college as you can when you're, you know, 70 or 80 years old. You never stop learning and you always have the ability to learn new things. So that was one um, neuro myth. I think the other one was that you're either a right brain thinker or a left brain thinker. And uh, although some people do have strengths in either, either of those areas, when it comes to learning, you actually use all parts of your brain to learn, not just one or the other. And, uh, and so those are a couple of the neuro myths that we talk about in the book. There's more, so uh, I, I won't give away all the, all the secrets, but uh, those are a couple of examples. What is the impact of motivational learning? Motivation is a you know it, it is uh, so powerful and uh, and yet interestingly enough we know a lot about how humans are motivated and how humans are motivated to learn yet we rarely apply those principles of motivation to uh, the world of work and industry and so Dan Pink talks a lot about this in his book called Drive. Uh, the surprising truth about what motivates us. And he talks about these three components. Uh, it's probably well known to some people, but it's autonomy, mastery, and purpose. Autonomy being this idea that, you know, people love to have um, the ability to learn what, where, and how they want. So imagine the what what's really happening in the world of work today is, is that companies are deciding, oh, this is what people should be learning they mandate it to their employees and what happens is that maybe a few people might be motivated by what's being uh, demanded of them to learn but for the majority of people they may not find it relevant they may not find it interesting they may not be motivated by it and so what we find is is that if you turn that around and say look we're going to provide our employees with uh, more autonomy with how they are mastering skills or mastering learning that when they get the chance to say um, this is what i'm really interested in this is what i'm motivated to learn and this is how i like to learn that the results are so much more powerful and it doesn't mean that businesses have to give up on saying, okay, employees learn whatever you want regardless of what the business needs. I, I think that it's actually um, something that we need to work in concert with where, where companies can more be giving some guidance about what they think employees should learn in order to align with the business vision and mission and goals. But employees can take it upon themselves to say, great, now I know where the company's going. Like they need more data scientists. I really want to do that too. Or Maybe they need uh, more managers and I really want to be, you know, I really want to invest myself in learning more management skills and kind of marrying what they're personally interested in and passionate about with what the company goals are. And then you get much more synergy between what the business wants, what the employee wants. And, and guess what? You get much more engaged employees because they're excited about what they're learning. People love to learn when they care about something and you can't make people learn but you can you can give them a, the autonomy where they really love learning. What about the impact of purpose? Purpose uh, too. What we're finding uh, more and more is that uh, people want to work for companies that have a vision and mission, and that people want to see that the work that they're doing is actually making a difference in the world. And you'll see it more and more. I, I think, you know, we talk a lot about generations and there's been a lot of research about the millennial generation really b being um, a group that wants to have work for a mission-driven company and they want to have purpose. But I would say that we're also not looking at other demographics because I would say even in the any generation, including the boomer generation, they everybody wants to have purpose and meaning and, and, and make it, they want to feel that what they're doing makes a difference. And it doesn't matter whether you're doing uh, tech work in Silicon Valley or whether you're working in a in the service industry people are doing if they're doing stuff that they love and they feel like they're actually helping helping the world you can find purpose and meaning in almost any work that you do well Kelly 
there's a story in the book that you talk about. It's um, the Bur Burberry CEO who was recruited by Apple, right? And so Tim Cook knew she didn't have any of the skills really that pertain to Apple, but she had a lot of other core skills. Talk about how skills are translated in the CEOs who recognize that. Yeah, I love the Burberry story, and uh, and I think one of the things that is so interesting about that is that you know here's here's a dynamic woman Angela Ahrens who came who who ran Burberry but actually brought it into you know the digital age and uh, and it was funny because we we talk about it in the book that um, you know she was a retail expert and had you know even though she might have been humble and said she wasn't really tech savvy she was and so she brought a lot of these skills that I think that. Um, that were important to the role that they hired her for at Apple. But what was most important, and, and uh, she has a fabulous TED Talk um, that, I, that I highly recommend, um, what she was talking about was building a, a culture that, um, that really inspired employees and that actually with, with the main vision of how do we, you know, if, if employees are our most important asset, how do we make the most of that and how do we help people develop and grow their careers in, a, in, a di in an amazing company like Apple? And that's what Tim Cook was looking for. He was looking for somebody who could um, it's kind of the some of the intangibles maybe in terms of how well Angela actually does that but the basics were is you know can you find a leader not so much not caring as much about the technical skills that they bring but but the the energy and the feeling that employees and developing them and helping them grow in their careers was going to be really great for business for Apple as well as for the employees so it's a win-win situation and uh, and that's why he he hired her I mean and I would say the true the same thing goes for a lot of our dynamic CEOs in the industry you know from Jeff Weiner at at LinkedIn to um, Satya Nadella at Microsoft who asks his employees to be learn-it-alls and not know-it-alls, which is an amazing um, tone to set at a company, right? Because a lot of times when you get into leadership and management ranks, um, and especially executive leadership positions, you're expected to, or you, you think you're expected to know everything. But the fact is, not everybody, no one knows everything, right? We all have something to learn. And by saying that you want your employees to be learn-it-alls rather than know-it-alls, it gives people permission to say, I can be vulnerable. I don't need to act like I know everything. And that um, actually being humble and say, saying, hey, I'm learning something new every day is much more appealing than an arrogance of, oh, yeah, we have, a bunch, we have the smartest people at our company and we don't have anything else to learn. So I think that, that CEOs can set that tone uh, and, and can really have a huge impact you know, on their employees. You mentioned the illusion of control and let people learn where and how they want. Um, you feel that works best? I really do because I think that um, what we're finding now, we did some research um, through Degreed last year where we asked how the workforce learns. And one of the things that we found was is that this is the reality of it, whether, whether companies want to realize it or not, employees are learning on their own all the time. They're spending their own time and they're spending their own money on learning because they're not getting what they need from their corporate uh, learning group at, at their company. And so they're, you know, as much as CEOs are worried about the, their employees not having the skills that they need to be successful in the future, employees are worried too. Employees are worried that they don't have the skills that are going to help them stay relevant in the workplace moving forward. So they're taking it into their own hands to say, well, if my company's not going to provide this for me, I will actually go out and do that myself. So that's the reality of the situation. So then if you take that into consideration and say, okay, if, if if our employees aren't getting what they need, maybe we can rethink our learning strategy at our company so that employees can get the learning that they need. And we're empowering them to learn what they want when, when they need it on the job. And I think that becomes so much more powerful than this illusion that 
uh, companies can say, we know every, we know what skills our employees need and exactly what they need to learn and how they need to learn it. It sounds a little crazy when you put it in those terms, but that's basically what we've been saying. And I think that there's also a happy medium. You know, again, I would say co companies have this great role to play in guiding, you know, employees because sometimes there are employees that don't know, you know, like what's next or what should I be doing next. And companies can be great at guiding their employees and and saying these are the trends that we see happening in the future. We we hear Unilever is a great example of actually saying we're taking it uh, from both perspectives. As a company, we're saying here are the skills that we think are going to be most important to Unilever moving forward, and here are some of the skills in each of the functional areas that think we think from a Unilever perspective that are very very important. And then, then they're saying, but we also want you to think about personalized learning. Figure out where your strengths are. Figure out how, assess, do a self-assessment against your own skills and understand what skills you have and what skills you need. And then take it upon yourself to put together a personalized learning plan where you can actually start building the skills that you want and need for your career now and for the future. And then if you think about marrying those two things, the guidance from the company, and the interests of the employees and where they are, because people are motivated by their career and what's next, right? They get excited about that. So you put that combination together, and how cool is that? That's, that's really a way that I think learning can be a huge competitive advantage and something that, uh, that's really key to a company strategy. And this is basically the steps that you just laid out about creating that culture of continuous learning on the job. Yes, and continuous learning, I mean, a lot of people don't realize, you know, that continuous learning means that learning isn't just a one-time event. A lot of times people will think, oh, we're running, you know, let, let's say that uh, they really want to focus on diversity at their company. And so somebody will come up with an idea, why don't we give all of our employees diversity training or unconscious bias training, which by the way, we've shown isn't, isn't very effective. It's like a one size fits all training that uh, doesn't really have the impact I think that companies think they will, but then they'll say, okay, they, they uh, measure that by saying, okay, everybody in our company took that training and they participated and so problem fixed. Everybody should now be, you know, um, trained against uh, being conscious about what their biases are, problem solved, we can move on. That is not the way learning really works. It, learning is not a one-time event and it's not a, just about communicating and imparting knowledge on people. It's a continuous learning cycle where, again, if we go back to that simple learning loop where you get knowledge, you, you practice skills on the job, you're actually getting feedback about how you're doing against those skills, and then you're actually reflecting on what you've done, that's a continuous learning process and it's not a one-time event. You have to build that into the flow of work so that every day you're conscious that, oh, I'm learning something new, how did I do on that? And that you're building skills continuously throughout your career rather than just uh, being asked to do what's you know required learning, if that makes sense. Well, it leads right into the next question of personalized learning mm. where the student is the teacher. Yes. So I love the notion of personalized learning, and I think some people have the wrong idea about that, that it just means that people are isolated and learning on their own and they're not interacting with people. But that's not really what personalized learning is at all. I mean, personalized learning is saying everybody's on a different uh, part of their learning journey and we all come to the table with things we already know and we want to build on that. So personalized learning is about getting a good assessment of who you are and where you are in your learning and or skills journey, assessing yourself against skills and then saying where do I have skill gaps and where do I want to focus my skills and I guarantee you that that's going to be different for every employee in the company, right? I don't care if you got the same degree at the same school at the same time or, or even doing the same job. If you ask somebody to assess themselves in their skills, they're going to be at a different place than the, guy, the person next to them that had those, those same things. And so this notion that we can 
create these learning programs that are for everybody, you know, that one size fits all is, is what's really broken about the current model of corporate learning. And if we think about personalized learning, then all of a sudden somebody can put together a plan for themselves to say, this is a skill that I'm weak at, that I really want to get better at uh, for my career. And here's my learning plan or my learning goal to help me get better at that skill where I, that I want to uh, grow at and then they can see progress against that learning goal and uh, and then keep you know like keep creating goals for themselves as a continuous lifelong learner you know it never stops because you can always learn new things and that would also combat um, content overload because then people are taking it in as they need it yeah, so the, the interesting thing about, you know, personalized learning, what we do at Degreed is we actually are helping to solve this content overload problem. So, for example, if, if, we, if we take what we just talked about, you've got a learning goal and you want to learn a new skill. Say you want to learn uh, better communication skills or presentation skills and you feel like that's one area that you know you you want to get stronger at as a skill then you the next thing you want to do for personalized learning is say okay well what learning am i then going to do in order to get better at that skill if you were to go out in the world and say there are thousands of pieces of content learning content around presentation skills or get, getting better at communication skills how do i make sense of it all how do I know what content is, is good or most relevant for me? And uh, that's, that's the challenge that we have with, we're, we're in an information abundant world where it used to be an information uh, scarce world where you know we, we only had a little bit of information to give to people. Now there's so much information, the challenge is what, what should I be focusing my time on and how do I know what's good and most relevant? So what Degreed is doing is actually uh, two things, allowing you to actually get curated content to say, oh, if you want to learn about presentation skills, we've actually uh, put together um, a list of learning that we think can be most relevant and effective for you. And it might include a podcast, it might include a class, it might include a video or a book or a chapter of a book to read. And then once a person goes through this curated content list of, of assets, then they can actually um, say, okay, I've gotten, you know, I've gone through this, I've gotten better at this skill, and then they can actually do a self-assessment again or get their manager to uh, assess them right in, in the product and, and see how they're doing against that skill. So I think that that's one of the ways we're combating content overload. In addition to that, we're also using machine learning, which means if you think about uh, Spotify for music. If, if people are using that, what, what you find is, is that there's playlists for music based on what you like and what you liked before. Same thing, machine learning will say, oh, you, you're interested in learning about this topic? We can provide you content that's relevant to that topic and then you can look at that content and we'll, it'll serve up new content to you every day and as it gets to know you better and what you like to learn and your preferences of learning, it'll continue to serve up content for you based on what it knows about you and what you like to learn. So there's a couple of different ways to combat content overload and th those are a couple of examples. Kelly, what about micro learning? Micro learning is um, this notion that you can that people don't have a long attention span, right? And that if you are to chunk uh, information up into smaller um, smaller segments, so people can digest it better, that's what micro learning is. So, if, uh, give an example. I mean, some people say micro learning can be as small as two to three minutes of a you know of a tidbit, which is fine. But I would say even um, like TED Talks are have a have a 18 minute content range, right? They they don't go beyond 18 minutes. Why? Because they feel like that's the uh, they've done some studies and some research to say that's the optimal time that people can actually sit and listen to something and still have their attention. Um, engaged in that actual piece of content. So micro learning can be, you know, one to two minutes. It can be, uh, it can be 18 minutes. It can be, and the the interesting thing about that is then you can string micro content together to be, you know, more of like a learning path. So say in, in a curated content path, even in degree, you can have chunks of micro content together, and then you consume it at your own uh, at your own pace kind of what you, yeah, so I think it's an interesting concept. Can any company, large or small, incorporate 
a digital learning strategy. Absolutely. I mean, what I love so much about what's happening right now in, in the world is that there's so much content out there and never before has there been a time, you know, everybody, most people have a cell phone. Never before has there been a time when you can learn any topic from any device anywhere in the world for almost low or no cost, right? Think about Khan Academy and TED Talks and YouTube videos. And then there's also a lot of great paid content out there as well. But say you're a smaller company and you don't have a huge budget for for learning, yet you want to um, you want to provide access to your employees to all this great free content. One one of the things you can do is just encourage your employees to take advantage of all the great free content that's out there. Other ways you can do that is you know investing in some technology that that gives employees the access to all of that free content, but then allows you to look at. Um, how people are doing with that, how to curate that content, and how to actually look at analytics about how people are learning and what they're learning. That can be really powerful. And then I think uh, companies, larger companies that may have bigger budgets are then looking at how they can incorporate other technologies plus paid learning content libraries into that whole strategy. But I would say if you have little to no budget, you have a way you can uh, really uh, focus on a digital learning strategy, and then if you're a bigger company that has bigger uh, bigger budgets and more employees to to worry about, you can have a more sophisticated uh, digital strategy as well, and everything in between. So yeah, it's possible, and it's and it's great. The one th other thing I'll mention is you know we interviewed Sal Sal Khan from the Khan Academy for the book, and you know one of the things it's completely free, right? They're providing free education to people around the world. And one of the most inspiring things I think I heard from Sal during our interview was, you know, their vision that, you know, they can, that people don't have to become, um, they don't have to be wealthy in order to get an education. They can actually get a free education anywhere in the world if they're motivated to do so. And he talks about the story of, um, a kid across the world with basically no money who actually put himself through, uh, you know, his own education um, uh, pathway where he could actually um, get a job, you know, at the at the end of that, where in the past that would have never been possible for someone across the world in a developing country, but now that's becoming possible. The only thing that's that's hindering people from getting an education today is their own motivation. Uh, to do so. So that's pretty inspiring. Should a company tailor its learning to fit the generation gap in the company? I, I, you know, the generation gap uh, question is an interesting one. And I'd say that more, more than tailoring learning to generational um, segments in the workforce, I think personalized learning kind of takes care of of, of how we don't really need to look at uh, generational gaps when it comes to learning. We can look at personalized learning as a way to help people regardless of what generation they're in. So for example, we talk a lot in the book about this over obsession with millennials in the workplace, right? I mean, when I was at LinkedIn, we were 70% millennials. And um, and that that was, you know, that was, I think, uh, uh, an example of a company where there's a lot more of one generation than another. But what about, I mean, th there's there's this great book out called The 100-Year Life by Linda Grattan and Andrew Scott from the uh, London School of Economics. And they write about the fact that we are no longer living in a three-phase um, life anymore. It used to be, you know, education was the first phase, then we had career and family in the middle phase, and retirement at the last phase. And if you think about how people are living longer, especially for the age group 50 and older, what we're realizing is boomers don't necessarily, either they financially can't stop working when they wanted to, or I think even more importantly, when they do have the choice whether they want to stop working or not, they're choosing that they want to work because it's going back to this purpose. It's like people want to have purpose and meaning in their lives, and if they're living longer, if when you're 
50, you look and you say, hey, I might have 20 more years of working or more ahead of me. What do I want this phase of my life to look like? And what do I want to learn? And how do I want to develop those skills? I would say that's the reality of the situation, yet most workforces, workplaces are not taking that into account. They're saying we should focus on millennials and what they need to learn and grow in their careers. And they're just beginning in their careers. But what about the 20 years of or more that people in the older generations might have, what if we were to focus more of our attention and our energy on that segment of the population? Think of how much expertise and mastery of skills they have to offer and we're not taking advantage of that. And I think that there's some creative ways we can think about that too, because the, one of the arguments I hear a lot is that, oh, well, older workers are just so much more expensive, and so companies don't want to hire them. They want to hire the less expensive labor of you know, the new college grads. But I would argue that, um, that if we think about the, the more flexible workplaces are, are becoming now and then the future, people can work where and when and how they want, um, giving that, that uh, demographic more flexibility in how and when they work is probably more important to them than the, the salary you know, that, that they're making. So maybe there's some trade-offs that we can make, but it's all about thinking about things differently. We're stuck in these old mindsets and yet we, we have a new, our, our work uh, environment has changed dram dramatically and we're not making adjustments to actually address those. We're just kind of stuck in, in these old models of working. So I think there's huge potential in thinking about multi-generations and how they can better work together uh, in the workforce, in the workplace of the future. And would that leads right into peer-to-peer -peer knowledge and sharing that, the young teaching the old, the old teaching the young. <laughs> Absolutely, and in fact, one of the, um, one of the things that I think, I love peer-to-peer -peer learning and I don't think that uh, companies have taken advantage of it at all uh, in the way we think about learning and work. And what we know about, um, about how people learn, uh, we have a couple of stories in the book where we talk about you know, world-class designers who have learned more from their peers than they did in any university setting, you know, which, is, which is amazing. And all the untapped mastery of all these people, these smart people that you've got in your workforce and yet they're sitting right next to you and yet you're not taking advantage of what they know and what you can learn from them because we don't, haven't really set up a learning environment like that. You might have examples of a lot of the tech companies that I know and that I've worked for will have things called tech talks where engineers or designers or product managers will teach what they know to their peers in the workforce, which is great, but I think that it's been kind of on a limited basis. Imagine if we really encourage peer-to-peer -peer on a large scale, it can be very impactful, especially in, in the flow of work. I mean, when, when you get a team of people together to solve a real business problem at work and peers are working together to solve those problems, that's an incredible example of how, of how powerful learning in the flow of work can be. And then back to your idea of, you know, young teaching the old and the old teaching the young. One of the biggest issues I see in the workforce today are the are, are the younger workforce are becoming managers much younger than ever before, yet they haven't had so much time even in the workforce, let alone as a manager, to really understand what it means to be a manager and a leader at a company. But imagine the, the boomers who have had a lot of experience in leadership and management and being in the workforce, maybe mentoring those younger workers who haven't had a lot of time on the job and are struggling with some of the basics like how to have effective one-on-ones, how to give their employees feedback, how to have career conversations with their employees. Those are basics of being a good manager, yet a lot of young managers haven't had a lot of experience with that. Imagine if they could get some mentorship from, from some of the workers who have had that experience so that we, work, we all work together to, uh, to make the workforce a better, uh, more productive place. How can a business understand the skills employees have and the skills they need. And we talked about self-assessment, which I think is an excellent idea. Absolutely. We write um, a section in the book about uh, something we're calling the skills quotient. And it's, again, exactly this question. How do you answer that, you know, from a CEO perspective, what skills 
uh, do the employees in my company have and what skills do they need? You can take that down to the next level at the organizational level or the group level. And again, you know, if you're a manager and you're saying, you know, I wonder, do I really know the skills that my employees have and the skills that they need? If you ask most managers and business leaders, they probably don't know that answer. They know what they hired the person uh, that they have on their team to do today, but do they necessarily know the whole portfolio of skills that that person has or maybe what they've done in the past? I've, I've run into that as a manager myself where I was running a, a, a PR campaign, campaign at LinkedIn for our learning organization and uh, really would have really wanted some PR expertise. And it just so happened I had somebody on my team who had a degree in PR who actually worked for another company running a PR campaign for a learning organization. And it was just by happenstance that I found out that she was on my team and had those skills because I had hired her in my organization to do something completely different. So I, I even have that own, my own experience of saying, do I really know the skills that the people on my team have versus versus you know, what we need. And then if you look at the individual level, you know, as an individual, uh, you're, you're thinking to yourself, do, what skills do I have and what skills do I need? I don't think we've asked that question enough. So the, the, the answer with the skills quotient is actually to say, um, we have this, uh, this framework where you've got levels and you can actually self-assess yourself against the skills you have and get a sense of where you're strong and where you need development. And you can do that for any role in a, in a company or in a, a dream role at, at another company. And then you can um, ask yourself, you can actually get, get a score. That's, it's kind of like NPS. Uh, for customer satisfaction. Many people in the industry know that if you ask a company, how do your clients feel about your company, you have an NPS score. What we're trying to do with skills quotient is say, you know, if you can, how can you answer that question? You know, do you have the skills that your company needs to move forward? The skills quotient score can give you that, uh, that skill. But basically it comes down to asking that question and getting the answer. You know, do you have, what skills do you have? What skills do you need? And what are those gaps? How do you fill the skills gap at your company is basically what we're, what we're saying. How a business would know that the learning is working and how to measure success. Do we measure it by the bottom line? That, that uh, profits went up? How do we measure that it's working? I think that um, in the past, let's look at what we've done in the past for learning. Um, in the past, it's been a huge challenge for companies and learning organizations to say, are people learning by what we're doing? And as I mentioned earlier that, you know, we've spent billions of dollars on these models that haven't really been able to give us the answer. And what do we use, what do we typically do? We typically provide companies with, here, here's what your employees have participated in, right? We, we develop a management development program and we've had 800 managers complete that program. That's what we tell people. But what does that tell you? Does that tell you what they learned? Does that tell you how effective they are on the job based on those new, new skills? No, it's, it's, re it's really hard to measure what people learn in those ways. So one of the things that I think um, is changing about that is talent analytics, learning analytics, and this idea that if you're actually tracking uh, and measuring what everybody's learning all the time and the skills that people are building, you can actually um, find out and answering that question, the skills you have versus the skills you need, whether or not people are actually learning and applying on the job. I think the other thing, and going back to your earlier question, you know, there's various points of rigor around how you really understand whether people um, are building skills and actually learning. So self-assessment is, is a less rigorous way to do it. You know, it's a little biased. I'm saying, okay, I'm gonna self-assess myself on my skills, but it will give you some indication of where to start with where you wanna, how you wanna build your skills. Next uh, phase, you can actually have managers, you know, assess employees like, you've set, assessed yourself and now I'm getting input from my manager and my manager has a little bit different view of my skills than I do, but that's great input. I'm getting feedback about the skills I have and the skills I need. And then you can move up the, up the chain to something very much more rigorous, which is skill certification, where you actually 
um, show evidence of what skills you have and what you actually know. So let me give you an example. You say you ha are a, an expert at social media and marketing or you're at a certain level and in order to do that you want to get certified in that skill. Well what you'd need to do is you'd need to actually submit some work that you actually did against social media and marketing. Oh, I ran a social media and marketing campaign for this company and this these were the results I had. And I also uh, ran a whole marketing plan on this. You actually submit work that you did in order to prove that you actually can you have that skill and this is what you know how to do. In addition to that, then you get peers saying, yes, I can vouch for so-and-so that they actually did run that campaign and they were great. And I'm also a social media and marketing person, so there's some validity into what I'm saying. So skill certification can be a performance-based, um, evidence-based way of saying, if you really want rigor and you want to know if people are really learning things and if they're actually are able to do that on the job, you can go to that level. So it's, you know, depending on the rigor from self-assessment up to, you know, uh, evidence-based uh, skill certification, you, depending on what you're trying to do, you can run the whole range from that to really understand how, how people are learning. And, and then you can then make those connections and those insights into the business's bottom line. Like what do we actually need for the business and are, are we be able to, being able to fill those skills gaps and have employees that are really gonna help us succeed in the future with the skills. What is learning agility? I love um, learning agility and people who have learning agility. When people ask me, what's the most important skill that people can have in the future? I say learning agility. And what that means is the ability to consistently or, and continuously learn all the time. And um, one way that you can, so I think that that's more value. Like you can say, you can do a skills assessment uh, among certain skills, but um, one of the issues that we have in the workplace today is people feeling like they need to be, you know, told that these are the things that you need to learn. Those people that, those employees that are most valuable are not waiting for anybody to tell them what to learn. They're always learning all the time. And I've had employees who have incredible learning agility and who have, um, been learning new skills on the job and teaching others on the team what they're learning. Those are the most valuable employees. And if you're a hiring manager and you want to know whether somebody has learning agility, ask them what they learned last week or what they learned last month or whether what they learned last year and listen to their answers. And if somebody's struggling to answer that question, they're probably not learning all the time. They're probably thinking, hey, I've learned the skills that I need to be successful at the job, but I'm really not needing to learn anything new. On, in, in contrast to that, you ask people that question and they're like, oh, I read this book last week and I went to this conference and you know, I was learning all about the new methods of, of this technology or I'm learning about cybersecurity. Whatever it is that they're passionate about, it will come out. And those people who are passionate about learning and are able to new, learn new things quickly and continuously are those that have learning agility. What should a forward-thinking CEO do right now? So I would say the, the best thing forward-thinking CEO should do right now is um, up-level this idea of, of a skills strategy as part of their overall business strategy. What we know today is that there's three things that are going on in the world of work today. It's acceleration, things have never been moving as fast and changing as quickly as they are today. Um, digitization, I don't know any company that's not going through a digital transformation right now in some way or another. And um, the third thing is automation. You know, we know that um, AI and robotics and uh, and all of that is is a reality of today. It's not the future. It's happening today. And so, with those three forces coming into play, it's impacting companies and the world of work and how we learn in dramatic ways. So, CEOs need to be thinking about that and saying, okay, with all of those things coming into play. Um, again, they need to ask themselves, am I, am I thinking about what we need to do to prepare our workforce 
for the future and make sure that we have the skills that we need and put strategies together. Like I'll give you an example at Visa, um, they actually recently hired a chief learning officer and they didn't put that role in HR. They actually put it in the strategy organization, the strategy person that works for the CEO. And if I talked about Unilever a little earlier, so Tim Munden, their CLO, is not creating separate learning programs based on the company's strategy. It's actually, they have a digital transformation strategy, a business strategy, where the skill strategy is part of that strategy, not something separate that's going on. So I think elevating it um, really realizing that this is a, a different time than we, we've never been in this state of, of flux and change in our, in our history. So how do we deal with that? Forward-thinking CEOs need to not wait, but actually put these strategies in place now and start having the conversation about, about skills at their company and upskilling and reskilling the workforce. I think there's a stat right now that says that most companies are going to have to uh, reskill or upskill 25% of their workforce over the next five years. And if you're not thinking about that right now, you're already behind, right? And if you think you're going to wait until, you know, it hits that, oh my God, we need, you know, 25% more of this particular skill in our company. And we're also, we're going to have to rush out and hire. A higher strategy isn't always going to work. You're not going to be able to find that many skilled workers in certain areas. And so you're going to have to proactively think about that strategy now and, uh, and really elevate this idea of learning and building skills and building a learning culture and, uh, and using data analytics to tell the learning story at your company. Those things are all gonna have to be elevated uh, to a different part of your company to really succeed in, in the future. Can an employee use their newfound skills as currency? So, uh, you know, I, I feel that, um, that skills and, and, and David and I, in writing the book, you know, we talk about skills as the new currency in the expertise economy. And I love this idea because if you think about it, if you think about the uh, workforce of the future, I think what we're moving towards, you know, we've seen the gig economy in action with a lot of more skills like Uber drivers or dog walkers or other things like like that but i don't think we've seen the gig economy in action with the knowledge workers in our companies so much you see some of it here and there but i think more and more we're going to see our workforce turn more into a gig economy where skills and what i mean by that are short stints of projects where you're looking for people with particular expertise or skills to work on a project for a period of say three to six months and when you interview for those uh, for those roles, you're going to say, "What sk I, there's certain skills that I need for people to apply on the job exact you know exactly now, and that people will work on that gig, that knowledge gig. They'll finish that and they'll move on to a, another. And so in that way, you can see skills being the currency in the expertise economy. In addition, uh, we've been working with some clients who were actually creating internal marketplaces uh, in their company where skills is, are, are the currency. And let me give you an example. eBay is a great example that has actually put together a program for their employees to say, you know, think about your career aspirations. Think about how you want to get better at the job you have today. And think about the job that you're dreaming about for the future and what skills you might need for that, for that role. And then they offer people the um, opportunity to learn and build skills using Degreed. And then they have created this career marketplace where they have listed uh, lots of projects that are part-time, maybe 20% time, or full-time jobs where they said, okay, now you've learned new skills, we're going to actually give you an opportunity to apply those new skills you've learned to either a project or a new job. And the goal there is, is that they're actually helping employees learn and build new skills, but giving them an opportunity to actually, instead of going somewhere else to apply those skills at another job, saying, no, you can actually learn and grow and get a new opportunity here at our company. And so that that's the main reason that people leave companies, right? They say, I'm not learning or growing and I'm not challenged anymore by the job that I have. So I guess I have to leave my company in order to get that new opportunity. But 
as eBay's strategy is is uh, is showing it's like you can actually create that internal career marketplace within your company keep your employees engaged and satisfied and hungry for the next opportunity and it's a great it's a, it's a great way to retain you know to retain your uh, amazing employees you already have so that's that's one example talk about the future you put out a vision of we work if we want to and our work is our hobby yeah. That's a great world. <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, there's a, there's a guy that we uh, interviewed for the book. His name is Alan Walton, and uh, um, he is a, a, a talk about a, a lifelong learner, somebody who's learning things all the time. He actually um, uh, talks, he, he's a data scientist, and he is actually right now working on uh, a, a think tank where they're thinking about the world a hundred years from now and w imagine what the world of work would be like a hundred years from now. It's hard to do because if you think about it, um, it's hard to imagine what work will look like even 10 or 15 years from now, let alone a hundred years from now. And we talk about this uh, uh, as well in terms of think about just a little over 10 years ago, the iPhone was introduced. And yet today, we can't imagine a world without mobile phones and mobile apps. We can't imagine a world where there aren't, uh, you know, jobs like driverless car engineers or drone operators. Those were jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago. So then we look, say we look uh, 10 to 15 years in the future, and we're talking about, you know, some of the things we just talked about, like, you know, uh, the gig economy for knowledge workers and skills as a currency. Those are things that are a little bit more in our grasp. But if you think about the, the future 100 years from now, uh, one of the things Alan was saying is, is that, you know, there's, there's one scenario where work isn't required anymore because machines have come to do all the routine tasks that humans are used to doing now. And so this is a more utopian view of the world rather than the, the doom and gloom of, oh, the robots are taking over and nobody's going to have a job anymore. Instead, he's saying, you know, look, there's we, ha we maybe have a higher purpose as humans in this in this world let the machines do the work that humans used to do and let's look at us about what's our purpose and passion in life and and what do we want to do and if you were given the choice of doing whatever you wanted to do what work would you choose to do even if it weren't you know work that you got paid for just work that you were passionate about to help humankind move you know move forward so this utopian view is, is one that i think a lot of people are are thinking about and dreaming about we'll see how the world progresses over time but the the one fact the one thing that can ground us in all of this is that AI is a rea reality right now, and automation is a reality right now. And I would, I would offer that we shouldn't be thinking about this as a doom and gloom, even in the short term, that there's a way for humans and machines to work together in order to have a really productive work environment. And we need to, you know, to take advantage of what makes us mo most uniquely human in this world. And we have empathy and we are able to problem solve and we have traits about us as humans that machines will never have. So let's, let's take the strengths of what machines can do and let's take the strengths of what humans can do and realize that it's gonna be a combination of these um, things that are going to make us most successful in the workforce of the future. Kelly, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much for coming in. I've so enjoyed it, and uh, thanks for having me here today. And thank you for joining us on Sartor TV, where thought leaders come to share their ideas. I'm Vanessa Tyler. I'll see you next time.